to be passed over from the wrath of God. And so this evening, I want to begin by looking at this week. In fact, what I'm going to show you on this slide is the last week of Christ's life. And I'm going to just kind of work us through it. But I want to begin by talking about the month of Nisan. In fact, notice on the screen, this is the first month in the Jewish calendar. No, that is not a Japanese car manufacturer. Okay, that would be with two S's. This is Nisan, the first month in the Hebrew calendar. Now, one of the reasons it's the first month to the Hebrews is because this is the month, of course, that God would take the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity. Now, for some of you that may be new to the Bible, one question you might think is, well, why was Israel in Egyptian captivity? Well, that's found in the later chapters of Genesis, where we see that God really uses Egypt, in a sense, as an incubator. And that's because there was a great famine along what we call the Fertile Crescent. Remember, the Fertile Crescent is the area just north and east of Israel in the Mideast, and it extends through that Mesopotamian area down through Israel and into Egypt. And because there was this tremendous famine, God allowed providentially uh, Joseph to be sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, Bob mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, that what Joseph's brothers meant as evil, God meant for good. Okay, so what happens is Israel comes into Egypt while Joseph is there, and they're saved from this famine. In fact, Israel becomes a great nation. And as they become a great nation, the Egyptians become very jealous of their growth, and they start mistreating them. And this mistreatment goes before the nostrils of God. He becomes very concerned about it, and he hears the cries of his people. And in God's providential timing, it was time for him around 1445 BC to take his people to their own promised land. Now, one thing I want to mention is that in Exodus 422, God declares that Israel is his firstborn. Now, you and I kind of yawn at that as Americans because the firstborn to us is simply the first child out of the chute, so to speak. And we typically, in our society, um, if we're parents, we want to see all of our kids equally have the same share of the inheritance if, if we're parents with children. But in the ancient Near East, that's not the way it was. The firstborn male was the one who had the inheritance rights of the father. So in Exodus 4.22, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh, you let my firstborn go. Israel is my firstborn. And what God is saying is that there's only one nation in all of the planet that has the inheritance rights of the father, and that's the people of Israel. Now, the reason that's significant is because Egypt, and specifically Pharaoh, who's leading it, is mistreating God's firstborn. So remember, there are nine plagues that precede the Passover, and all of them are very difficult, but yet Pharaoh hardens his heart, the Egyptians harden their heart, and they won't let God's firstborn go. So on the 10th plague, which is the Passover plague, God sends a destroying angel to kill all the firstborn of Egypt. And it's as if God is saying, if you're going to mess with my firstborn, I'm going to kill yours. And so he does this tremendous reversal. And so the only way, as the destroying angel comes in, that the Israelites can spare their firstborn is that they would be hidden by the blood of the lamb. And of course, this ends up foreshadowing the work of Christ. Okay, now what I want to focus on here is, first of all, the 10th day of Nisan, the 10th day in this very important month of the Israelites. And the reason why is this is the day that the Israelites were commanded to select a lamb, a lamb without blemish. In fact, turn your Bibles to Exodus 12, 1 through 5, and we'll read that. Exodus 12, 1 through 5. Now, I'm going to be reading my notes. I actually have another computer above this one. This office is just laden with technology. It's almost like mission control here, almost. So here we'll read Exodus 12, verses 1 through 5. And by the way, when Bob or me or whoever is teaching, make sure you have your Bibles there. One of the reasons we want to look up these verses is because we know there's going to be kids uh, watching and learning with you, and they can learn where these books are in the Bible as well. So again, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. Listen to what it says. It says, now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, he said, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you 
And let's just stop there in verse two. So again, that's the month of Nisan. Again, the reason it's so significant is this is the month God is going to take them out by a mighty hand to be his own. Verse three, it says, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Verse five, he says, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, dear ones, I want you to notice again, on the 10th day of the month of Nisan, what are they to do? They're to select a lamb. But notice in verse five, this lamb is to be what? Without blemish, okay? So what this means, of course, in the original context is when an Israelite would give an animal as a sacrifice, you couldn't just say, well, you know, this animal's gonna die anyway, and it's got a bad wheel and a third eye. I'm gonna give that one to God. No, God demands the best. You don't give them the garbage, you give them the best. But what it ultimately is foreshadowing, this idea of blemish is really a symbol of sin. So later we're gonna see that Jesus is the unblemished lamb. Why? Because he is without defect as well. He is without sin. Okay, so that's what it's designed to foreshadow. So again, we have the Israelites selecting their lamb on the 10th day of Nisan. It's to be without blemish. And I want you to think about for 14 centuries, the Israelites were selecting a lamb and the lamb had to be without blemish. And all of a sudden Jesus comes in on the very 10th day of Nisan, and what he's going to say is, here I am. I'm the lamb without blemish. Now, what I want to show you is that indeed, Jesus Christ comes in on the 10th day of Nisan. We're going to read Luke 19, 41 through 42. So please turn your Bibles there, if you will. But what I want to do first is I want to lay out the case that Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem on a Monday, not a Sunday. And the reason I want to do that is I know in most of our traditions, we celebrate uh, Lamb Selection Day as Palm Sunday. We call it Palm Sunday, or sometimes you'll read in your Bible, it's referred to as the triumphal entry. But what I want you to see is it more than likely happened on a Monday rather than a Sunday. Now, let me lay out the case for you. Uh, beginning in John 12, 1, the gospel is very clear that Jesus came to Bethany. Remember, Bethany is that city about two and a half miles to the east, southeast of Jerusalem. Well, according to John 12, 1, Jesus was there uh, six days prior to the Passover. Now, the Passover, of course, occurs on Friday. So this means that Jesus was in Bethany on Saturday. It would have been Saturday, the 8th of Nisan. Okay. Now, why was he there? Well, remember, in John chapter 11, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Okay. A very powerful miracle, which foreshadows his own resurrection. But what happens in John 12, 1 through 8 is that evening, this would be Saturday evening, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they have a dinner. And this, of course, is where Mary anoints Jesus with that very strong, uh, costly perfume. And of course, Judas objects to it. Now, the reason I point this out is when you get to John 12, verses 9 through 11, it says a great crowd gathered to see Jesus. Why? Because he has great notoriety. He's obviously just healed a man. In fact, he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And so not only does the crowd want to see Jesus, they want to see Lazarus. Okay, now I'm telling you that because that must have happened during the day. So that means this occurred on Sunday. Okay, by the way, interestingly, if you read the John account in chapter 12, Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And you know who wants to kill him again? The Jewish leadership of Israel. <laughs> they want to kill him again. That's how jealous of Jesus they really are. All right, that's pretty bad. Now, when you get to John 12, 12, remember this is on Sunday that the crowd gathers. But when you get to John 12, 12, it says on the next day, and it leads you in to what we call the triumphal entry. So the next day had to be, look on the screen, it had to be Monday. Why is that significant? Because it wasn't just any day, it was the 10th day of Nisan, the day that for 1400 years, the Jews had been selecting their lamb without blemish. And Jesus Christ comes in on that very day, presenting himself as the lamb of God, saying, choose me. I'm the one without blemish. I'm your paschal lamb. 
So I want to read Luke 19, 41 through 42. And what you're going to see is very sadly, the Jews misunderstood why Jesus came. And Jesus knows this. Listen to what Jesus said as he enters into Jerusalem. Luke 19, 41 through 44, it says, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. Verse 42, it says, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. So notice what Jesus is saying. They missed the time of their visitation. Now, why is that? Remember, Jesus is God. He knows the thoughts of men. And so even though the Israelites are crying out, seemingly these accolades of the Messiah, they're saying, Hosanna, save us now. Psalm 118, 25, Messianic. They're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, 26, it's Messianic. So it seems when you read the text that they must see Jesus as the Messiah. But Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, knows that ultimately these Israelites are looking for a Messiah who is the Lion of Judah, who destroys their enemies. They're not looking for the Messiah who is the Lamb of God, who takes away their sin. They missed it. They didn't receive their unblemished Lamb. In fact, so devastating is their rejection that Jesus predicts their own destruction. In fact, notice in verse 44, he says, your enemies are going to level you on every side. They're not going to leave one stone upon another. There he's describing the destruction that comes upon Jerusalem in 70 AD that happens 37 years later. Okay. Now, is it interesting? He says, that's going to come upon you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. The term visitation is very important. Bob has actually done a lot of good work in his writings and some of his messages on this. The term visitation is episcopate. It's where we get uh, the term episcopal. It's often used for an elder. So an elder is one who visits on behalf of God, the people of God. But as it's used of God visiting his people, it's used for either salvation or judgment. So when God visits, if you believe you're saved, if you're in disbelief and therefore disobedience, you're going to be judged. So for example, in Exodus chapter three, God visits his people. He visits to save them, but to pour judgment upon the Egyptians. Well, here, Jesus, the Paschal Lamb, comes in. He visits the people of God, but they won't trust in him, and therefore, they're going to get the judgment of God. Okay, all right, so that's on the 10th day of Nisan. That was Lamb Selection Day. Now, what I'm going to do is forward four days. I'll come back, and I'll fill in the rest of the chart. But we want to go to the next day that's covered in the Exodus account. And this is the 14th day of Nisan. This is the day that they sacrificed the lamb. So if you will, look at Gen or excuse me, Exodus 12, verses 6 through 7, and let me read that to you now. So continuing on, this is what God says they're to do with their lamb. Exodus 12, verses 6 through 7, he says, You shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door, doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So here's what God is commanding them to do. They're to slay the animal and they're to take the blood and they're to put it on the doorposts of their home. And the reason they're to do this is when the destroying angel comes, he's going to see the blood of the lamb and he's going to pass them over. Okay, that's the idea. And so the idea then when we get to the New Testament is if we all apply by faith, the blood of Christ, we are also passed over the wrath of God. That's what the symbology is driving toward. Now, what I want to point out here is that Jesus here, of course, is crucified on this very day. Now, the reason I have Matthew 26, 1 through 2 up is simply because their Jesus on a Wednesday says that in two days, he's going to be crucified on Passover. Okay, now the reason I'm showing you that passage is it proves Jesus was crucified on Passover. If Jesus says it, it's true. So we don't have to go into any goofy scholarship where they're saying, no, it really wasn't Passover. Jesus himself says he was crucified on Passover. 
Now, let me talk a little bit about the day that Jesus was crucified. Remember, he goes to the cross at nine in the morning and he's crucified for six hours. He dies at 3 p.m. In your Bibles, it'll say the ninth hour. But it's very significant that the hour that he dies, because in the temple in the day, there was three waves of sacrifices of the Paschal of the Passover lamb. They would have a wave at three o'clock, four o'clock, and five o'clock in the afternoon. So the first wave of sacrifices would begin at three. And according to Alfred Edersheim, a very good scholar on the temple, what would happen is they began to sacrifice these Passover lambs right at three. A giant shofar would be blown. And what would happen is anyone who was in the hearing of that shofar around the temple, they would take a moment and pause, knowing that the Paschal, the Passover lamb is being slain for them. And it was in that very moment, as the shofar blew, and that moment of silence was taken, that Jesus breathed his last, and he said, it is finished. Yes, dear ones, the Passover lamb was slain at the very moment in that day as the Passover lambs would have been slain in the temple. Unbelievable symbology. Okay, now let's go on to the 15th day of Nisan, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And what I'm going to talk about here first is what would they do on the Feast of Unleavened Bread? The Feast of Unleavened Bread began with God commanding the Israelites to remove all of the leaven from their homes. Remember, leaven is used to make bread rise. Well, why God did this was because they're going to be leaving in such haste because of his power that they're not going to have time to allow their bread to rise. So that's why they're to clean out their leaven. But what I want you to see is that they're leaving in haste wasn't because they were fearful. It was actually because the Egyptians were fearful. In fact, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 through 34. Please turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12, verses 33 through 34. I'll give you just a moment to turn there, and I will find my passage here. Exodus 12, verses 33 through 34. So remember, in Exodus 12, after we've just read verse 7, what happens is you have the destroying angel come, and he kills all the firstborn of Egypt. And it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a child, if it's a squirrel, a bird. Um, there's, there's prisoners in prison. It talks about the oxen and the cattle. If you're the firstborn, you die in Egypt. And it is absolutely devastating. And so devastating is it that Pharaoh finally says, you people have to go. In fact, notice what it says in Exodus 12, 33. It says, the Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we will all be dead. Verse 34, it says, so the people took their dough before it was leavened. These are the Israelites with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes and on their shoulders. Think about this. When I would talk about or think about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I often thought that, yes, the Israelites had to leave in haste. But oftentimes I got the misconception that it was fear within them. They're going to be leaving in such terror. They're going to be leaving in a hurry. But the ones who were really in terror were the Egyptians. And so what the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorates, the reason why the Jews are to perpetually keep that feast, is that it's a powerful reminder of the powerful hand of God. That he could take the most powerful nation at the time, Egypt was a superpower. And he could devastate them to the point where the Israelites would leave in such haste, they didn't even have time to allow their bread to rise. Now, what's interesting to note is, remember Jesus, look on the screen, if you will. He was buried, of course, on the 14th day of Nisan, on part of the day. And the Jews, of course, reckoned any part of a day as a day. So that's day one. But he's in the ground on the full day of the 15th day of Nisan. And what's interesting is his burial, in a sense, is also a demonstration of the power of God. Now, here's why. You remember Jesus calls himself the bread of life in John chapter 6. He's the bread of life. The idea is that if you believe in him, you're going to have eternal life, not just temporary life. But Jesus, the bread of life, interestingly enough, is also born in Bethlehem, which is the house of bread. So you have the bread of life who's born in the house of bread, and he's buried during the feast of unleavened bread. It can't get any more perfect than that. Jesus himself said in John 12, 24, that's the reference that I have, you want to turn to it, John 12, 24. Listen to what Jesus said. 
John 12, 24, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, there's the bread, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. When Jesus dies and he's buried in the ground, it seems that this is a terrific tragedy. That's all it is. But in fact, it's a great display of the power of God. Why? Because he's going to bring forth one day a glorious crop, meaning all believers who trust in him will be raised as well. And that's why, very ironically, he is going to be raised not just on any day, but his resurrection on the third day occurs on a feast called First Fruits. Now, let me explain First Fruits to you because this is a feast that the Israelites didn't partake in while they were during and uh, living out the Passover. The reason why is because this is a feast that they have to live out once they get to the promised land because it's a harvest feast and they don't have any harvest and they don't have time to do this because they're leaving in such haste. So in Leviticus 23, what we're going to find out is this is what they're going to do when they first get to the promised land. But well, listen to what it says. Turn your Bibles to Leviticus 23, 10 through 11. I'll give you some time to turn there. Again, Leviticus 23, 10 through 11. Leviticus 23, 10 through 11. Notice in verse 10, God says this. He says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land which I am going to give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. Now notice verse 11. What's the priest going to do? He says, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. Now, first of all, notice in verse 11, it says the day after the Sabbath. This was the day after the Sabbath of the Passover. So again, if the Sabbath is on the 15th, then the day after that would have to be the 16th. Okay, and that's why it was known to happen on the 16th day of Nisan. So what would happen is the Israelites first come into their promised land. Remember, they're to do this during the Passover, which happens in April, May. So they have very little of their crop. There's hardly anything that's come up off the ground. But what God is commanding them to do is to take what little crop they have and to make a wave offering. And what that means they're going to do is they're going to take the first portion of their harvest, which is very little, and they're to wave it in front of the Lord. And they would say something like, oh, Heavenly Father, uh, Master of Heaven, the God who gives us all good things, Lord, we thank you that we have this much of the harvest, and we trust you that one day the rest of the harvest is going to come. That's what they would pray for. The first parts of the harvest, the first fruits, represented trust that one day the rest of the harvest would come. Dear brothers and sisters, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, meaning that one day we can also trust that the rest of the crop is going to come. That's you and I. That's all those who have trusted in him. So again, when you look at the imagery from the Passover, look at these four. These are the four big days. Jesus comes in, not just on any day, but lamb selection day. He's saying, here I am. I'm the unblemished lamb. Select me. 14th, he's crucified the day they would slay their Passover. In fact, at the very moment that they began, he breathes his last. He's in the ground the full day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the bread of life born in the house of bread. And he's raised not just in any day, but the Feast of first fruits, guaranteeing one day the rest of the crop is going to come. Dear ones, that's perfection. And it's that perfection and it's that profundity that I think should show us that Jesus alone is the ultimate Passover lamb. Now, let me go to the other days and put these up, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I want to put them all up on the screen, and we'll kind of go through each one of them here. And one of the reasons I want to put them all up is I want you to remember something important. Remember on the 10th day of Nisan, when the Israelites were to select their lamb, it was to be a lamb without blemish. And in essence, what they had is they had four days to determine if that lamb had a blemish. They had the 11th, the 12th, 13th, and part of the 14th. Okay, so all the time they had this lamb, they had to make sure that it doesn't have a, lemon, a blemish. They had four days to check it over. In a sense, this is what happens during Jesus' ministry in these last days. He's being checked over by the leadership of Israel. He's in constant debate with them. In fact, it culminates in them examining him on Friday. Remember, he's arrested 
before, before the Sanhedrin, the leadership of Israel. They can't find anything wrong with them. Then he goes before whom? He goes before Pilate. He can't find anything wrong with them. Then he goes before Herod Antipas. He can't find anything wrong with them. And then he goes back to Pilate. Pilate washes his hand. He doesn't find any fault. They can't find any sin in Jesus. He is the unblemished lamb. They can't find any blemish in him. And yet because they're sinful men, they crucify him anyway. But we have to know that this crucifixion was God's foreordained plan. Yes, it was evil, but according to Acts 2.23, it was the foreordained will of God that it would occur. But he was found the unblemished lamb. Now, let's start in Tuesday. Let's just talk about what Jesus does here on this Tuesday. Notice here, he ends up cursing a fig tree. How does this happen? Well, as Jesus enters into this last week, he's using Bethany as his base camp. Okay, so he stays with Lazarus and with, you know, Mary and Martha. The disciples are with him. And so, you know, I'm saying this facetiously a little bit, but they're taking their lunch pail. They're leaving Bethany each day, and they're going to Jerusalem to debate and to, and to, to minister. Okay, so that's what they do. They leave Bethany, and on the way to the temple, they come across a fig tree, which Jesus curses. Now, this is very significant. Why does Jesus curse it? Well, the fig tree looked very ornate. It looks like it should be bearing fruit. But as Jesus inspects it, he sees that there's no fruit on it. And what you find out is the fig tree is a symbol of Israel. Israel looked very ornate. They looked as if they were the people of God, and yet they were fruitless as well. Okay, and so they are as cursed as the fig tree. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. So Jesus curses it. Now, we're going to come back to that in the next day. But from there, what does Jesus do? Well, he cleanses the temple. He goes in and remember the passage, the zeal of the Lord's house has consumed me. He finds that they've made the temple into a den of thieves. These money changers are ripping people off. And so he drives them out and, in fact, overturns tables. And this, in fact, infuriates the leadership all the more. And they seek all the more to want to kill him. Okay, now let's go to Wednesday. Again, Wednesday, Jesus leaves Bethany on the way to Jerusalem. And when he comes in, um, I couldn't put it on the screen, but he comes across the, the fig tree again. Now it's not just cursed, it's actually dead, it's withered. And the disciples see that and they realize because Christ cursed it, it's destroyed. And of course, that's what's going to happen to Israel because they didn't bear fruit, because they didn't believe in the Messiah, they're going to be destroyed as well. And 37 years later, in fact, they were by the Romans in 70 AD. Now, what Jesus does then, right after the cursed fig tree is he goes into the temple and he debates. You, you see this, for example, in Matthew 23, where Jesus excoriates the leadership of Israel and the people are responsible for their leadership and the leadership is responsible for the people. And so as he's excoriating the leadership of Israel, he's excoriating Israel. And he links them to those who have always killed the prophets that God had sent in the past. And at the very end of Matthew 23, Jesus says, your house is left to you desolate, and you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's from Psalm 118, 26. Psalm 18, 26, excuse me, 118, 26 is a messianic psalm. So what Jesus is saying is you will not see me again in this temple until you recognize that I'm the Messiah. Now, when he leaves them desolate, what you really have is the glory of God in Christ leaving their temple. Now, the reason I mention this is jot this down. You can read this tonight before you go to bed. Jot down Ezekiel chapter 10. And the reason I want you to jot this down is I want to make a connection for you that I think is very profound. In the, in the year 592 BC, six years prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, there was unbelief in Israel to the point where God left his temple back then. Again, this is hundreds of years earlier, 592 BC. And it's recorded in the 10th chapter of Ezekiel. God is so angry with his people that the Shekinah glory, the very dwelling presence of God, left the temple. And in, when you read Ezekiel 10, what's very interesting, as the glory of God departs the temple, he goes out to the east, to the Mount of Olives. Fast forward to Jesus' day. Jesus is the glory of God. There's unbelief in Israel, and he leaves their temple desolate again. He's abandoning the temple, the glory of God, and he goes out to the east, to the Mount of Olives. 
the same thing has happened in history because they had missed the time of their visitation. Now, what does Jesus do then when he goes east to the Mount of Olives? Well, he teaches the Olivet Discourse, the longest running discourse in our New Testament, in, in the Gospels. Okay, it's all about his second coming. So that's what he does there. Now, on Thursday, he institutes his Lord's Supper as he celebrates a Passover with his disciples. But one of the questions that have, has often been raised by scholars and by skeptics alike is how is it that Jesus could celebrate a Passover because the Synoptic Gospels claim that the Lord's Supper was a Passover. How could Jesus celebrate a Passover on Thursday with his disciples and yet be the Passover lamb on Friday? Okay, that was the, the conundrum. Well, to me, the best answer to that was found by a man who wrote a book, and I'll plug this book later. It was a man named Harold Honer. He was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. And what he found insightfully, I think, was that at the time that Jesus was teaching in his earthly ministry in Israel, there was actually two different reckonings of a day. For example, the Galileans reckoned a day beginning at sunrise. Okay, so the Galileans, remember Jesus began his ministry in Galilee. That's where the headquarters was. All of the disciples are Galileans. Okay, and the synoptic gospels follow the Galilean reckoning. So according to the Galilean reckoning, the 14th day of Nisan actually began at sunrise on Thursday. So this is what allows Jesus to really have a Passover on Thursday. But what's interesting is the Judean reckoning of a day began at sunset. That was because the Sadducees ran the temple. Okay, so the Sadducees began the 14th day at sunset. So that means under that reckoning, the 14th would have began here Thursday night and would have extended all the way through Friday. Okay, and that's what John's gospel follows. He follows the Judean reckoning. Okay, so what this allows then is that it allows for Jesus to really celebrate a real Passover on Thursday and yet be the official Passover lamb that's crucified on Friday. Now, you might ask, well, why would the Sadducees allow there for it to be two Passovers? They love that. Because remember, during Passover, you had 2.7 million people who would come into Jerusalem. And they didn't have mass transit. And they didn't have you know fancy cutlery and chainsaws. They had to sacrifice all these animals. All right, so that gave them two days to do it. Now, the final thing I want to point out that's very significant in Jesus last week is that he goes after the Lord's Supper, he goes to Gethsemane, the garden. And the reason this is so significant is him being the Lamb of God is this is where Jesus shows us he's our new representative. He's the perfect one. Because Jesus goes not to a garden of perfection, but he goes to a garden where he's pressed out by the weight of sin. All right now, here's what I mean. Think about the very first chapters in our Bible in Genesis. You have a man named Adam who is living in a garden of perfection. He is living with God himself. He has all that he needs. Nothing is withheld from him. There's one tree that he can't eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And nonetheless, this man, Adam, in this garden of perfection says, not your will be done, but mine be done. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's pressed out by the weight of the world, and so fearful is he, he literally prays, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. It's the opposite. He's the opposite of Adam. And so it shows us that he is the faithful son, the faithful man that no man ever was. He's our new Adam. He's our new representative. Dear brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ fulfills all of the imagery of the perfect man, the unblemished lamb, who could bear the sins of the people and move them, remove them in one single day. In fact, it's beautiful to see that throughout the New Testament, the New Testament writers see Jesus as the Passover lamb. We're not reading into this something that's not there. In fact, let me just cite a few verses. You don't have to turn to them, but just jot them down. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says this. He says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. 
By the way, we see this in 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. Jesus is the unblemished and spotless lamb. We see the same thing in Revelation. Revelation 13, 8, Jesus is the lamb who was slain. Over and over, the New Testament depicts him as the lamb of God. And so that's what I want to leave you here this evening with is what John the Baptist said regarding Jesus. Listen to what John the Baptist said regarding Jesus during his ministry. John 1, 29 through 30, John the Baptist said, the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Notice the declaration by John the Baptist that Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God. Now, one of the questions this raises, and I'm saying this perhaps we have some skeptics watching, one of the questions people ask is, why did God have to have a sacrifice anyway? Okay, now when we come to the Passover, perhaps God could have used another means. But ultimately, I believe the Passover lamb was chosen in Exodus because it was designed to foreshadow the work of Christ. But when it comes to the person and work of Christ, God could not save us any other way. Okay, now here's why. The reason why God had to have a sacrifice in Jesus is because, yes, we see in our churches today, especially in the postmodern age, God is certainly loving. And we should celebrate that God is loving. It's true, he is. But he's also just. And because he's just, he must punish sin. In fact, in Psalm 89, 14, it says that the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice. Righteous means that he is the one who defines what is right and what is wrong. And just meaning that he is the one who must punish those who violate his holy standard. Now, if God is just and he must punish sin, and by the way, Malachi 3, 6 says that God will not change. So he's not going to change just because we become sinners. He's not going to just sort of wink at our sin. He remains just and he must punish it. Let me say it again. He must punish it. So if God is just and he must punish our sin, but yet he desires to show us mercy, how can he do both? That's where you need the sinless lamb. That's why you need the God man. Because you need a substitute who can both maintain the justice of God and also represent the people. And so this is what necessitates the sinless lamb of God being truly man and truly God. He has to be man to represent us, but he also has to be God to be of infinite worth to pay off an infinite debt. And lo and behold, notice here in John 1.30, he's both. Notice John declares that the Messiah is a man, but he also declares that he's God. Notice he says he existed before me. Does everyone know here that John the Baptist was technically born? He was older than Jesus. So when he says that he existed before me, what's he saying? He's talking about his pre-existence, isn't he? He's talking about his deity. So in this one passage, John is talking about the God-man. Perfectly man, truly man, so he could represent us. And truly God, so that he could save us. That's why Jesus Christ had to be the Lamb of God to remove our sins. Jesus came to be a substitute. So he would take our place to remove our sin debt. That's what he did. So when Jesus dies on the cross, he's what's called a propitiation, which means he appeases the wrath of God, upholds God's justice because he is payment in full. And so it's this idea of substitution that allows us to be forgiven our sins because Christ paid it all. We see this idea of substitution all over the Bible. You see it, for example, in 2 Corinthians 521, where Paul says that God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin on our behalf, their substitution, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Dear ones, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood, as it says in Hebrews 922. But in Hebrews 104, it says that the blood of the animals, the blood of bulls and goats, can never provide sin. They're all designed to point forward to the unblemished lamb, Jesus Christ, the only one who could remove sin. Now, the proof that Jesus removed our sins by his propitious and substitutionary death on the cross is seen by the fact that on the third day after his death, he was bodily raised from the dead. We're going to be celebrating that and examining that this coming Sunday. His resurrection proves all of his claims. When Jesus says, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We can believe that why he was raised from the dead. It proves that he is the spotless Lamb of God. Dear ones, this Jesus ascended into the heavens where he's seated at the right hand of God. He's coming again to bring a glorious kingdom and a resurrection for his people, but judgment upon his enemies. And it's this Jesus who commands all of us to repent and believe. This Jesus is the one who commands us to believe in him as the Passover lamb. You know, today we talked a lot about the 10th day of Nisan and how it was lamb selection day. Well, during the church age, in a real sense, every day is a lamb selection day. Jesus himself said in John 6, 37, that he would by no wise cast out anyone who came to him. And so if you have breath in your lungs today, today is the day to make Jesus Christ your Passover lamb. Trust in him and your sins will be forgiven and you will have everlasting life. You will be passed over from the wrath of God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for these great truths and how you've made it known that there's only one man in history that could be the unblemished lamb. We do thank you for the perfection of your words that we may not grope around in the darkness as the pagans do, but that we may know with certainty how we can be saved, how we can come into relationship with you and live lives that are pleasing to you. I do pray, I do pray for my dear brothers and sisters that you would sustain them during these difficult times of COVID-19. Lord, that we would focus our hope upon you and your glorious kingdom that you're bringing, that you would set our hearts to focus on the resurrection that's coming this Sunday that we're going to be celebrating. I do pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for any who are hearing this message who have never believed. I pray that today they would select the lamb, the lamb without blemish, and they would find eternal life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, by the way, I have to relinquish control here off of my PowerPoint somehow, but I just want to plug my book here. This is written by a man named Harold Honer. It was written in 1974. I was one year old. But the book is called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. And I think that this would be a wonderful read for many of you if you want to teach your children about the life of Christ, uh, the year that he was born, the year that he was crucified, the day that he was crucified. It gets into Daniel's 70th week. There's a lot of great material. You could probably find these on Amazon or uh, CVD, Christian book distributors, etc. But Harold Honer, again, the Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. I've had this book about 15 years. I've read it through three times. It is a dynamite book, and it gets into even greater detail some of the information that we looked at today. So God bless all of you. I look forward to seeing you all. Remember, we have Hebrew, I believe, this coming Sunday, if I remember correctly. Um, if not, uh, Adam will let you know. But we're going to have our message on the resurrection and some more worship songs by Steve. God bless all of you. Have a great evening.